Hi everyone, thank you uh, uh, for joining us again and welcome back to the Nico the Vet Show on YouTube. So for today's discussion, I thought we might tackle the subject of Cushing's disease in dogs. It is pretty much a dog issue. Theoretically, it can happen in cats, but it's not something I don't think I've ever seen a confirmed Cushing in cats, Cushing's case in cats. Uh, it also happens in, in human beings, so some people have some familiarity uh, with it. So first of all, what is, uh, what is Cushing's disease? Now, Cushing's disease is probably the most commonly encountered problem that we see affecting the endocrine system. So just to backpedal again, so what is the endocrine system? Uh, throughout our body, we have a whole bunch of glands uh, that produce various hormones which are required to keep our bodies going. So probably the most familiar gland that, that we're all familiar with is the thyroid gland, so on either side of our neck, and their job is to make uh, the hormone thyroid hormone. You get other glands like the pituitary glands in our brains, uh, right at the base of your brain, right at the very bottom, just above your, your hard palate, you've got a little, a tiny little, almost like a grape hanging off your the bottom of your brain, that's your pituitary gland. It has a lot of functions, we'll touch on that a little bit later on uh, does many many things some of uh, part of it it secretes its own enzymes and uh, uh, and hormones and the other part of it is it tells the other glands in the bodies what um, in the body what what uh, hormones to release other uh, glands would be the pancreas which is the gland that lies along our stomach in the first part of our small intestine Two functions, one of which is to produce uh, insulin, uh, which again is part of the endocrine system. And then we have the adrenal glands, uh, which are tiny little glands that live just beside our kidneys. Now, all mammals, all mammals have them, and they're important glands. They have a lot of important functions. Uh, they produce, amongst other things, um, uh, cortisol, uh, which is a, effectively a steroid. And we'd be familiar with taking it as a medication, taking cortisol for things like hay fever, asthma, eczema. But our bodies produce cortisol of themselves, which is very, very important for us in terms of regulating our, our weight and our sugar balance, our appetite, and just our general well-being, amongst other things. Um, probably also worth mentioning in the endocrine system are the gonadal tissue. So in girls, the ovaries, and boys, the, the testicles or the ghoulies, uh, they also produce hormones important to, um, to the body. So we're going to focus on the adrenal glands, the ones next to the kidneys. Now those can become overactive or underactive. So if they're underactive, we call it uh, Addison's disease. And if they are overactive, we call it Cushing's disease. Uh, but technically, Cushing's disease should be called hyperadrenocorticism. Now again, like all medical terminology, it sounds cleverer than it really is. Uh, hyper means too much of, adreno means adrenal gland, cortex means the outer part of the adrenal gland, ism means it's a thing. So it's an overproduction of hormones, from the adrenal gland, which is hyperadrenocorticism, uh, but we commonly call it Cushing's disease. I've not looked into it, but probably it's named after Dr. Cushing's, who probably first described it probably, I don't know, 150, 200 years ago in human beings. His counterpart was Addison, Dr. Addison, who diagnosed the opposite, the underproduction from the adrenal glands. Uh, I know he was in, in London. So, so what's the mechanism? What, how, how, does your, how, does your, how do your adrenal glands work? And I'm going to say you, because you and I have them too, and dogs have them too. Um, so think of it as a two-stage system. So in your pituitary gland, that little grape-like thing we spoke about in your brain, within the pituitary gland, uh, that, uh, there's, there's a part of it that produces uh, uh, a hormone which tells the adrenal gland lower down next to your kidneys what to do. So think of the, 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 the bit in your, your pituitary gland, think of that as the, the head office, and think of the adrenal glands next to your kidneys, think of them as the factory. So what happens is the head office is in charge, it controls everything that happens, the head office sends a messenger chemical uh, uh, or hormone to the adrenal glands and tells them, right, we need you to make uh, uh, cortisol. So the, the factory starts making the cortisol, the head office in the brain, the pituitary, that monitors the cortisol production. And when it's about right, it says, okay, we've got enough, you don't need to produce any more. Uh, and when the levels drop a bit low, the, again, the, the head office is monitoring it and it'll say, right, we need more. So the head office is constantly sending uh, information or think of it as memos or emails. They're sending emails or memos down to the down to the factory saying, right, up their production or decrease the production or you're doing just fine, keep the production at that sort of level. And by doing this, the body keeps itself 
very much in a, in a status quo. So when you have Cushing's disease, the problem can be in one of two places. The problem can be at the head office. So what I mean by that is, uh, the, when, if you have Cushing's, and we talk about pituitary dependent Cushing's, and this amounts for about probably 95% of cases in dogs, where the problem is in the head office, and specifically, it's a microadenoma. So again, medical jargon, micro means very, very small, adenoma means uh, a tumor. So you get a tumor growing in the part of the pituitary gland which produces the the hormone or the memo or the email that system that gets sent down to the factory and and this tumor of itself is usually not uh, catastrophic it's usually about the size of a pinhead it generally doesn't grow so it's not like an expanding brain tumor i i have seen that happen once in a, in a little french a little Frenchie called Jack, uh, and that was catastrophic for him. It did keep growing and growing and growing, but almost all the cases, if you have a pituitary-dependent Cushing's case, that means you've got a pinhead-sized tumor in your brain, uh, and the tumor per se is not the problem because it's not expanding and getting bigger, like I say, but the problem is it's sending too many memos. It's producing too much of the hormone, which tells the factory to make more um, um, cortisol. So you've got these hundreds and hundreds of memos coming down. The factory goes, oh my lord, I'll, I'll try to keep up with all this uh, demand for increased production and it produces more and more and more cortisol and then and then we have an excess of it in our bodies. The flip side is the head office may be fine. So the head office uh, of itself, there's no tumor, there's nothing wrong with the head office in the pituitary. It's sending the appropriate number of memos down to the factory. The problem may be in the factory per se. So there may be a tumor in the factory and that tumor just doesn't listen to head office. So it just churns out uh, uh, cortisol and it doesn't care about the memos it's getting from the head office. So it's not being regulated up or down by the, the, the head office. And those tumors uh, in the adrenal gland, so we call those adrenal dependent uh, Cushing's disease, those cases are, are far and away in the minority. They account for 5% or perhaps even less of cases. Um, and they, are, they may be better or they may be worse uh, uh, than the pituitary dependent ones because if you have a benign tumor, so a not a cancerous tumor um, producing uh, the, the cortisol in your adrenal gland, potentially you could remove that adrenal gland and you would be cured. So on, on the statistics, if you, if you are the 5% case, um, so 5% of Cushing's cases, the problem will be in the adrenal glands, in the factory. And of those, half will be benign tumors, so they are correctable by surgery. Half of them will be malignant tumors, malignant cancers, and they cannot be corrected by surgery. So, so there's the split. So uh, just to review that, so if you have Cushing's disease and you're a dog, a 95% chance that the problem is a tumor in the pituitary, microadenoma, doesn't get any bigger, but it sends too many memos to the factory. 5% of your Cushing's cases will have a tumor in the factory, which is, uh, which is what's causing the overproduction, and half of those will be malignant, half of those will be benign. So either way, whether the problem is in the brain or whether the problem is in the adrenal gland, the net effect is you are making too much cortisol. So for anyone who's ever been on cortisone, or people colloquially call them steroids, anyone who's ever been on steroids for a while will tell you exactly what happens. Uh, so, so whether you are taking a lot of steroids for your hay fever, asthma, eczema, uh, whatever condition you might have, so whether you are taking too much cortisol, steroid, or whether your body is overproducing it, um, you are going to present uh, uh, with the same symptoms. And what are the symptoms? Um, first and foremost, um, steroids uh, or cortisol particularly, if you have too much of it, it will make you hungry and thirsty. So your appetite will go up, you will eat and you just don't feel sated and you eat and you eat and you eat and you eat and, there's, and it's a very striking um, uh, change in the dog's appetite. Also drinking more, they will just drink more and more and more and you never really feel that you've slaked your thirst. Uh, and so you just carry on drinking, carry on drinking, and the more you drink, the more you're going to wee. So I would say about 90% of Cushing's cases are going to have that as their predominant symptom. So drinking a lot and or weeing a lot. Some, generally you notice the drinking a lot, a lot more but I suppose if you had a swimming pool or something and the dog might be drinking from the swimming pool and you're not seeing that happen, you might not notice the increased drinking. Certainly if they're drinking from a bowl that you have to refill, it's, it's bloody obvious. You, you, you're not going to miss it. Uh, for, for people who do have a pool and don't see the dog drinking more, often they'll notice the increased weeing because, of course, whatever you drink in has got to find its way out again. Um, and they'll notice that the dog asks to be let out several times uh, uh, during the night, uh, and that may often be the first symptom. But as a general um, rule, if you're thinking, oh, okay, my dog's got the symptoms, that I'm going to uh, rattle through in a moment. If you think 
my dog's got these symptoms, could they have Cushing's? Ask yourself the question, is, uh, uh, is he or she, are they drinking a lot and or weeing a lot? And 90% of cases will do. So basically it's a filter. If, your dog, if you think your dog might have Cushing's, but they're not drinking a lot and they're not weeing a lot, it's quite unlikely that they would have Cushing's. So what other symptoms do we have? So you're eating a lot, you're drinking a lot, you're weeing a lot. Um, the other symptoms you'll see is what we call trunkal obesity. So trunk, uh, it just means the body, not, not elephant trunk, it just means the, the body. So you get um, trunkal obesity, so your body gets quite fat and rotund, and in fact your legs get quite skinny because your muscles start to waste. So, you, so, you, so it's the opposite of bodybuilding, your muscles start shrinking back. And it's not, it's not super, super skinny, it's not like sort of supermodel skinny, <laughs> I don't know how politically correct or incorrect that is. Um, it's not that kind of skinny, it's, it's just more more noticeable that your muscly dog is now, or your normally muscle dog, has now got less muscle. And it's quite striking. So you get these fat little bodies and these skinny little legs. And the fat body particularly, the, the abdominal wall muscles, so the six pack that you see uh, in the beautiful, the beautiful people, that muscle, uh, the abdominal wall, starts also to get weaker and thinner. And then the organs inside, uh, as you start to accumulate fat inside and your liver swells under the effect of the, of the steroid, you just get more stuff in your, in your belly. And so as you look at the dog from the side, they have a very distinct little pot belly like uh, middle-aged men like, like me have. So. Uh, so you get fat little bodies with a pot belly, skinny little legs, eating a lot, drinking a lot, um, uh, weighing a lot. Uh, and with time, as time progresses, the, the coat will start to thin. So, so there's far fewer hairs per square uh, inch on the surface of the body. So they've got thinning hair, again, just like middle-aged men like me. Uh, and they may also be prone to secondary infections in the skin, uh, which you often see as little round sort of rings of scabby itchiness. Another symptom is also panting. It just makes these guys pant more. Now, panting, remember, is not the same as breathing. So they're not breathing faster. They're just <laughs> with the mouth open, panting. So if you see all of those symptoms, stand back and also take, take a look at the bigger picture and go, well, what is the context? Meaning, what is the age of my dog and what is the breed? Because def although this can happen in, in, in any age or breed of dog or human being for that matter, although it can happen across the board, there does tend to be a trend. Most of the cases that we diagnose are in cats older than about eight years old. Um, and um, I find it tends to be the smaller dogs. I have seen it in bigger dogs. Probably the biggest dog I've seen it in was a Rhodesian Ridgeback, and he was a massive dog. He was about 80-something kilos. Um, uh, a little bit overweight, and, and as it happens, that's why he was overweight, was the Cushing that gave him that fat body that we spoke about. But as a general rule, it tends to be dogs who are sort of eight years or more, and the smaller breeds, so typically poodles and the little terriers. And because of that trend to be in the older, littler dogs, people will often miss these signs because they'll see the dog sort of drinking more and they think, well, in a, in a more senior dog, and they think, well, he's drinking more, but his kidneys are probably not working that well. And these dogs become uh, a little bit weak because they've lost the muscle function. So they, they become a bit sluggish, a little bit lethargic. Um, so they're drinking more, peeing more, doing less, less active, panting more, getting a little bit fat uh, with skinny legs. And people can sometimes confuse that just with aging. They go, well, there's nothing wrong with him. He's just sort of aging appropriately. And this is what I expected to see in my aging dog. The answer is, it may not be. It, I mean, it could be aging. Um, but if you're seeing all these symptoms, particularly the big thirst, uh, 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 coupling onto all the other things, get it checked. Go to your vet and, and just have the, have the conversation. So once we've decided, all right, we think this dog ticks enough boxes in terms of the symptoms that we've discussed. And also, um, in terms of what they look like. So it's a very typical, if you just Google it and have a look, you see the very typical appearance of this fat body, pot belly, thin coat, uh, uh, wasting muscles, a uh, little dog who's eating and drinking like there's no tomorrow and peeing like Niagara Falls, very likely you've got Cushing. So you go to your vet and you, and you open the discussion and you say, this is what I think it is. So the first thing that we do uh, uh, is do some blood tests. Really, that's the, that's the only way to definitively diagnose this. Um, and there are a couple of blood tests we can run. There's the ACTH stimulation test, or uh, most commonly we use a low dose dexamethasone suppression test. So what do we mean by these? So ACTH, if we go back to the beginning of the talk, stands for adrenocorticotropic hormone. It's the hormone which is produced by your uh, uh, pituitary gland in your brain, by the head office. That's the memo or the email, which then gets released, carries by the blood supply, carried through by the blood supply, goes to the adrenal glands, the factory, tells them to make more. So we do a thing called the adrenocortic adrenocorticotropic hormone uh, uh, suppression test, meaning if we inject you, so we, so we start off, we measure your cortisol level, 
we then inject you with this uh, with this hormone, uh, which is just exactly the same as what your brain would have produced. In effect, now you're sending more memos to the um, uh, uh, to the adrenal gland, uh, telling it the factory telling it make more cortisol. So it's, that's why it's called an ACTH stimulation test. So we artificially sending more memos to the factory and saying right make more. If you are a, a, a normal factory, meaning you've not got Cushing's, then you'll increase your production a little bit. You'll say, okay, I've got the memo from head office, make some more, I will. But if, you, if you've got Cushing's disease, basically you get the memo and then you just completely over, over, over supply. So the head office says, make a little bit more and you make like a ton more. There you go. That's the test. So we've just tested how sensitive you are to the stimulation. The flaw, not the flaw, but the limitation of the test is it's probably only about 85% accurate. So it'll pick up 85% of cases and about 15% of cases it will plain out lie. And so if you have a case that you strongly think has Cushing's, you've run the ACTH stimulation test, you've not sort of crazily stimulated, so you're not a positive, and you still think, hang on, I still think you've got this, then we can look at the low dose dex dexamethasone suppression test. And that's just the reverse, that's a, that's a suppression test. So what that's doing is it's, um, we, we Take, again, we measure your cortisol level. We then inject you with some cortisol, and that circulates in your blood supply. And as that circulates through the head office in the brain, the head office should look at that and go, oh, blimey, we've got a lot of cortisone here. We don't need much more. So we'll send a memo to the adrenal gland saying, right, just slow it down. We don't need to produce so much. And what you should see is the production of steroid or, or cortisol from the factory should go down. Whereas if you've got Cushing's disease, again, they just ignore the memo and do what they like, and so you don't suppress. You don't get that, what we call negative feedback from the brain, where the brain, the pituitary gland says, right, whoa, 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 stop production, and production should just slow for a while. We don't see that if you've got Cushing's, production just, just churns on. So you fail to suppress. So there's two types, just to, just to sum up. You get the ACTH stimulation test, where we, where we stimulate you. We say, right, make more, and then if you completely overdo the making more, there's your diagnosis, or we do the low-dose dexamethasone suppression. We give you a little bit of steroid, which should tell you to drop production, but you, you fail to drop production. So if that happens, uh, either one of those tests will give you the answer. There's some debate about which one should be run first and which one should be run second. Uh, I tend to, I think, pff, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. Uh, and you can run one or the other, but if you get a negative from either and you don't believe it, run the other. If they both say negative, probably it's a negative. So once you've got the result and you say, right, you are now, you have Cushing's, um, probably as an aside, sometimes where you don't suspect Cushing's at all and your dog has a routine blood test for perhaps something else maybe they're a pre-anesthetic they seem well but you're just checking their their bloods before they go to anesthesia or in fact they're ill with something else something that may give you an inkling that there's that there's Cushing's going on in the body is you may get an elevation in the liver enzyme so all that that tells you on the routine bloods is that there is some inflammation or, or, or congestion or obstruction of bile flow in your liver so it's a very non-specific result it's just your liver enzymes come back elevated and in crude terms tells you the liver is not happy and that that can happen with Cushing's too because that's the effect of cortisol on on the liver which is just one of many things that may produce that in the liver. So sometimes you weren't looking for Cushing's, you didn't think there was Cushing's, uh, but you've run these routine tests and ooh, your liver tests are up and you think, oh, well, okay, now that I'm thinking, now that it's focused my mind, it may well be. The only way to then definitively know is do the other, do the ACTH or the low dose dex uh, uh, suppression test, and that will give you the diagnosis. So, so sometimes the routine bloods will be the prompt rather than the, the symptoms that we're seeing at home. So once you've got the diagnosis, say, right, that's what it is. Again, 95% of these will be pituitary dependent. So the problems are uh, uh, in, the, in the head office, in the brain, and 5% will be in the adrenals next to the kidneys. It's often worth putting an ultrasound scanner on these guys and just have a look at the adrenal glands, really just to try to rule out an obvious, um, uh, an obvious tumor. Um, because like I say, if you do have a tumor in the adrenal gland, you've got a 50% chance that you can cure your dog just through, through surgery. So let's say you've done all the tests now, uh, you've confirmed that, right, that's what the dog's got, what do I do? So uh, treatment-wise, uh, apart from the surgery that we've spoken about, which is only appropriate, uh, well, not only appropriate, you, you could do surgery on the adrenal glands, it's only appropriate if you don't have the cancer version. I'm not sure that uh, you could do it on the cancer version, but they tend to spread so early on in the disease that, yes, you may re remove the cancer from the adrenal gland, but um, it 
it may well have spread to the rest of the body. And I think it, these cases are tricky. You're probably best off going under the care of an oncologist for these. But if we play the numbers and just look at the trends, um, if you do uh, a scan on the adrenal gland, and there's clearly an obvious tumor in there. One can do a fine needle aspirate from it. If it's not cancerous, one can do surgery. But in the 95% of cases, uh, it's in the brain. So what can we do about that? I know in human beings, they'll often do the brain surgery. They'll go in and remove this little microadenoma from your pituitary gland and effectively you're fixed. Uh, and for them, it's, it's, it's not necessarily a big deal because in human beings, it's, 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 access is better. Uh, they go up various ways. I think they go up through your nose or through your heart pads. I'm not entirely sure. In the veterinary world, the technology is not quite there. I mean, we're getting there. Uh, the clever people at the universities who do this kind of thing. So there, you could consider surgery, but I, I'm not sure I would at this Stage. I just think it's in its infancy and it's not a proven reliable way of doing it. So mostly in the veterinary world, we're left with medically managing these guys. So we're gonna give you medicine to make the problems go away. Uh, and really the only medicine uh, which is, uh, that is worth considering is a drug called trilostane. Effectively what that is, is you take, you take your medicine and it goes in and it destroys part of the factory. So it, doesn't, so it does nothing about the head office. It destroys part of the factory, which is the adrenal gland next to the kidney. And basically, if you destroy three quarters of your factory, you will destroy three quarters of your production. So it doesn't matter if the problem is actually in the uh, pituitary gland in the brain, in the head office, because even though they're sending hundreds and hundreds of nemos down in the form of the ACTH hormone, the factory can't respond because there's just less factory. So, so, so trilostane is a very useful drug in that regard, um, but it does, it, it takes a big commitment because if you're going to go with trilostane, you have to give the trilostane, and although there's a starting point for the dose, we're heavily dependent on repeating blood tests, repeating the ACTH stimulation test uh, uh, on a very fixed protocol, which is often uh, uh, 10 to 14 days after we start, and then uh, the treatment, and then a month after that, and then a month after that, and sometimes two, three months monthly, until you stabilize because every individual is different and again there is no magic dose that works for everyone so we start you on a dose we we, we, we re test you so we're testing basically the production capacity of the the factory of the adrenal glands and we jig the dose up or down uh, accordingly once we've got enough of the factory destroyed that it can only produce the appropriate amount um, then you are committed to lifelong therapy on these guys so you need to stay on that on the medication forever if you stop the medication the factory will repair and recover and uh, um, you'll be back where you started from so um, so the treatment is, is efficient treatment um, there have been some cases reported of just unexplained death uh, on dogs on trilostane, where literally you start them on this drug and they just drop dead. Uh, and nobody can prove that it was the trilostane or it wasn't the trilostane. Uh, but I think uh, there's enough where they smoke this fire, there's enough there to say, well, there's a small risk that, that uh, you may have a, a terrible response to the drug. But that's true of any drug. I mean, we're not banning penicillin, but I mean, even though we know that a small percentage of people, for example, will have an anaphylactic reaction and may die from penicillin, but that doesn't mean it's the work of, of the devil. Uh, it just means like any drug or anything in the world, uh, it may cause undesirable effects, uh, significantly undesirable effects, like uh, uh, end of life in um, in a given individual, but for the vast majority, we're fine. So although trilostane can have this catastroph catastrophic outcome, uh, it's a drug I wouldn't hesitate to give my, my own dog. I think it's a perfectly sensible, reasonable drug to give. So so what puts people off, apart from, I mean, it's a lovely idea and I would recommend it to everybody. What puts a lot of people off is the cost. The trilostane, the drug is expensive, the blood tests are expensive, the monitoring is expensive, and the veterinary time is expensive. So you really are, if you're going to treat, it's really an all-in. You can't sort of say, well, I'll just treat and just guess how well the treatment's working and make dose adjustments according to uh, my gut instincts. It just doesn't work like that. You have to commit to the to the, to the testing. So some people say to me, I, either I can't or won't um, afford uh, that extra expense in my life. What will happen if I do nothing? And the answer is nothing catastrophic, assuming you don't have the cancer version. So assuming, assuming you're the, the, the usual, if there's such a thing, Cushing's case. Um, which is the 95 percenters with the microadenoma in the brain. If we don't treat them, um, they're just going to live with their symptoms. So they will be hungry and thirsty and we a lot forever. They will have the pot belly, fat body, thin coat, skinny legs appearance forever. They're going to pant forever and they uh, will be more uh, lethargic and more sedentary than if they didn't have the condition. Um, but uh, again, it's not massively dissimilar to, to growing older. And if people can live with that, meaning a dog's not peeing all over the floor and it's driving you nuts and damaging your relationship with the dog, um, then if you don't treat them, um, it's not necessarily a train smash, because remember, we're usually diagnosing these uh, cases in the older patient. Um, so they are sort of in the, 
it sounds awful. They're, they're in the sort of the home, the home stretch of their lives. And I really feel that even if we don't treat them, if we can live with the symptoms and if the dog can live with the symptoms, then by not treating them, they're not going to live shorter lives. They're not going to live any less of a life. Theoretically, if you've got Cushing's and too much cortisol in your body, it can make you hypercoagulable, meaning you're more inclined to throw a clot, which means you're more likely to have a stroke or a pulmonary embolism. Um, that's a theoretically, yes, that's that's a risk. In reality, it's just not something we see. So if you have Cushing symptoms which are very, very mild and you don't fancy the commitment, then you're not doing your dog a disservice by saying, well, I'm just going to watch the space. I'm not going to treat it because, again, they are, uh, most of the cases are very, very, liv very, very uh, livable. Uh, but you get some dogs who are just clearly just are feeling horrendous. They're just feeling weak, lethargic, these great big bellies, frantically hungry and thirsty and just feeling rubbish. And it's pretty, pretty bloody obvious who, who those ones are. Then really, uh, you know, sell the car, uh, basically do uh, whatever you can to try to sort of raise the finances to treat these guys. Because again, if we treat them and we commit to the treatment and we commit to the monitoring, we will uh, massively improve their quality of the life. So I think it's, it's, it's appropriate to treat pretty much all, if not, uh, well, most, if not all of these cases, um, but it's not imperative that you do so if they are quite mildly affected. Um, so uh, there you go, take that home, digest it, see what you think about it. Thank you once again for tuning in to the show. Uh, and thank you as always to the people who have sent their uh, questions and communications and their kind comments. Um, I'm uh, um, contacting you now, what is it? Uh, Christmas of uh, 2020. So hopefully next year will be better for all of us. So once again, thank you all for dialing in and um, uh, have, a, have a good Christmas if you're still having Christmas, uh, um, but probably you're watching this after the event. So otherwise just have a good year. Thank you, bye-bye. Basically, do uh, whatever you can to try to sort of raise the finances to treat these guys. Because again, if we treat them and we commit to the treatment and we commit to the monitoring, we will uh, massively improve their quality of the life. So I think it's, it's, it's appropriate to treat pretty much all, if not, uh, well, most, if not all of these cases. Um, but it's not imperative that you do so if they are quite mildly affected. Um, so... Uh, there you go, take that home, digest it, see what you think about it. Thank you once again for tuning in to the show. Uh, and thank you as always to the people who have sent their uh, questions and communications and their kind comments. Um, I'm uh, um, contacting you now, what is it, uh, Christmas of uh, 2020. So hopefully next year will be better for all of us. So once again, thank you all for dialing in and um, uh, have, a, have a good Christmas if you're still having Christmas, uh, um, but probably you're watching this after the event. So otherwise just have a good year. Thank you, bye-bye.